Uh, good morning, and thank you once again for joining us. Uh, I know these aren't ideal elements, uh, but at least this side of the building is a little warmer because we're in the sunshine. Although I probably will get a sunburn because uh, <laughs> I didn't put my uh, sunscreen on. Uh, on the heels of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, our state and our nation are facing a mental health crisis. Anxiety, depression, OCD, stress, loneliness, job losses, loss of childcare, school closures, and loss of loved ones are just some of the ways that this pandemic has taken a toll on people's emotional and mental health. Connecticut residents are experiencing these issues and our state is also experiencing an overburdened and overwhelmed mental health system that is making it even more difficult for people to access treatment. It is a priority for the General Assembly to address the mental health crisis and help all people, including women, children, and vulnerable populations all across our state access is needed quality health care to support their mental health and the health of their loved ones today we are here to share a package of proposals offering a better way to a healthy Connecticut the package contains policies that will do a number of things first it will increase access to mental health care by removing barriers to early intervention. Two, it will support the mental health workforce and encourage recruitment of our top talent to provide quality care to meet the demand. We need more infrastructure. We need to increase the mental health bandwidth. Three, it will address the youth mental health crisis and help families navigate and access what can be life-saving care. And finally, it will improve screening and support maternal mental health. One in seven women experience prenatal mental health complications, yet it is estimated that 50% of women who are depressed remain undiagnosed during and following pregnancy. The pandemic has worsened stressors, and Connecticut lags behind other states in screening requirements and education for both providers and patients when it comes to postpartum support. We are joined by our ranking members on public health today, as well as, as, well as other members of our caucus and also advocates, who can better explain the extent of these problems that exist here in Connecticut that demand action. With that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Senator Tony Huang. Thank you, Senator Kelly. I, I am very proud here to be here today with our caucus proposals on the issue of mental health. It is obviously a critical issue, and I want to provide some data points for you. In December 7, 2021, the U.S. Surgeon General issued an advisory that highlighted the urgent need to address the nation's youth mental health crisis. According to the report, depression and anxiety symptoms among our youth doubled during the COVID pandemic, with 25% of the youth expressing depressive symptoms and 20% experiencing anxiety symptoms. And in early 2021, the emergency departments throughout this country have reported suspected suicide attempts that are 51% higher for young adolescent women and 4% higher for adolescent boys compared to the same time period in early 2019. That is a disparate gender difference and it shows a remarkable need that is out there in the marketplace. And we've also have heard in local areas an overflow of our emergency rooms for adolescent mental health supportive services. It is at a crisis mode. And then we have to address the pandemic in exposing some of the fissures that we've seen and exacerbated it. The isolation and the lack of in-person communications and interactions, not only in our schools, but our interpersonal dynamics. The rarity of being able to gather and, and to be able to express ourselves 
has not only created social emotional dynamics, but it has also created a cover for some of the aspects of domestic violence, mental health aspects that just doesn't get discovered. So the pandemic has not just created an existing problem, it has exasperated and created a bigger gulf in regards to the need that we have. I think it's important to bring it back beyond statistics that we have heard heartbreaking stories of real life struggles on social emotional dynamics. Sometimes those stories are tragic and have significant consequences for the individual, but also those families that struggle with that. I think another aspect of it is the fact that I truly believe that mental health crisis right now has created a correlation with the need for substances and a potential increase in abuse incidences. We have found that there are needs for coping with mental health struggles with substance abuse. And that is a dangerous aspect, particularly when you think about the, the, the current curse of fentanyl. But I think ultimately we also need to look at a societal issue and what we're doing in this legislation and in this press conference is raising the awareness to remove the stigma of mental health, not only in our youth, but in our general society. And I think the idea of talk and legislating is critical. But I think with these set of proposals, we are in a position to act. So I, I'm absolutely proud to be a part of this presentation. But I also want to take the moment to acknowledge the people that know these issues better than anyone else. People that have lived through these stories and these traumas and these individual professionals that have been there on the front line providing supportive care and services. One such individual is Michael Patota, the CEO and of Children's and Family Guidance Centers which serves the southwestern region, and I'll let him explain the breadth and the critical need that they have as a service and what they have seen in the landscape right now. So uh, I'll present to you Michael Patota, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Child and Family Guidance Center. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Well said. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Michael Patota, as the Senator said, President and CEO of the Child and Family Guidance Center. Each year we provide about 3,500 children and their families with outpatient mental health treatment and care management uh, to kids uh, in Fairfield County, primarily in Bridgeport area. We know that the mental health crisis for children transcends political parties. We also know that in crisis there's opportunity. There's a wonderful opportunity to really put our mouth, our, our money where our mouth is. We all talk about this crisis it's not going to get resolved without fully funding treatment for children and their families. As an organization, we are supportive of this legislation that's going to increase capacity and also access to treatment for kids and their families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I also would like at this time to recognize Antonia Edwards who is here today uh, to recognize the memory of her grandson, Norvon Edwards, and struggles and the struggles that her family has endured when it comes to accessing mental health services for youth. Antonia. Hi. Thank you, everybody. I want to first, this is my grandson, Norvon Edwards. He expired on August 2020 due to a mental health crisis. A lot of people have heard this story because I've testified about it, but today I really appreciate the fact that Senator Kelly, Nicole, Jason sat down and looked at all the documentation, the pictures, the videos that we have been fighting for for the last four years to get help for his sister, sibling, who killed him. So I'm just gonna put this here. I'm gonna start off with a story. This started off as a domestic violence situation. Okay, thank you. It started off as a domestic violence situation. They were kidnapped by their stepfather. That failed us as well too. There was no domestic violence. Um, services available, so basically my daughter, who was struggling with two kids, going through a kidnapping and a divorce, had to struggle on her own. Because I've been in this field since 99 as a family advocate, I was trained in Boston, where I'm from, I've been in Connecticut for four years and basically hit the floor with legislating, my, my record speaks for me. I'm on several boards, CBAC, Children Behavioral Advisory Board. I'm um, on the Council for Connecticut Council for Dem Dem Disabilities. I have really worked hard in Connecticut. I am absolutely disappointed that I have worked so hard to understand Connecticut and have sacrificed my life, volunteered, and as a result of that, I have lost a life. My grandson died 
on my watch because there was no services available or due to the racial disparities and implicit biases, we were discriminated against for getting services. So after the, after the kidnapping happened, we tried to get services for my granddaughter, took her to different um, facilities. They made a mockery of us. Oh, there's nothing wrong with her, why are you here? We had videos, we had documentation, we had drawings of her and, of, and coffins with our names. They thought that we were just being exaggerated. These kids' accounts were coded Mount Sound Syndrome by proxy. I literally watched my daughter go through this. And because I, I am an activist as far as being an advocate, they tried to isolate me from her from being a natural support. So basically, they just made a mockery of us. And everything that my granddaughter said that she was going to do, she did August 20th, up to, uh, August 8th, 7th, up, up to 19th, up to 2020. It just really bothers me that nobody listened. And I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. These issues were here way before we got here. They were here way before COVID. COVID just unveiled them. So I could be very bitter. I could walk away and I'd be like, you know what? I'm really angry with Connecticut. I'm angry for the people that didn't listen to us. But I'm fighting for other parents not to go through what I went through. And if I don't do that, then my grandson has died in vain. So I feel that the, the services that should have been rendered or, the, or the, the things that should have been done weren't done for basically for racial um, in place of biases. And I'm not saying that mental health is not across the board. It affects all of us. But there's two Connecticut's, as pointedly said by the CT mirror. There's a two sets of standards here. And I, and I was discriminated, and my daughter was, as a result of it. I hold you, and when I say you, the providers, the doctors, the, the, the service industry, for not saving my grandson's life. My grandson didn't die because my granddaughter killed him. My, my, granddaughter, my grandson died because nobody provided services to her. And it was clearly that she was crying out for help, and we were too. So I want to make a remarkable change. I want to make sure that my grandson's name is not in vain. I want to make sure that no other parent has to go through what we're going through. I talk to parents in the community, and in, in the black and brown community, it's a, very much taboo about um, mental health. So I talk to parents, they're hiding the stuff. They, they don't want to deal with it because they don't want to deal with the racial disparities. They don't want to deal with the DCF being called on them every five minutes. I want them to open up and tell their truth. I'm not the only person that's gone through this, and neither is my daughter. And I want them to have free access to services. I want them not to be discriminated against. I want them not to be talked to in a condescending way. I want them to be taken serious. My grandson died because nobody took all three of us serious, my granddaughter, my daughter, and myself. So one thing I want to say to you is that I received citations from Lieutenant um, Susan Bicewich with my grandson's name in it. I also received the citation from Justin, Mayor Justin Elliger. These two people, out of all the government institutions, gave the most heartfelt condolences, and I know for a fact that they felt that. And I was really shocked to receive this. By getting these, I know that not everybody gets citations. So this means a lot to me. That means that something's wrong, we acknowledge it, we're trying to figure it out. It's not their job to figure it out, it's our job as we the people. It's our job as legislators to put this stuff together and figure out how we can save these kids' lives. And I'm begging whoever has the purse strings, put the money up to save our kids. This all happened as a result of closing, you know, saying residential um, um, facilities, trying to save money, and this is what we now have. When I talked to Senator Kelly's office and I talked to Nicole, they said, Antonia, what do you think you would, would work? A standalone emergency behavioral health facility urgent care. They have one in North Carolina. It works. It's called CMC Behavioral Health. Instead of unindating the ERs and they're looking like war zones with kids on mats on the floor, have a standalone facility that specializes in mental health for children. It can for adults, but I'm here for children. And that way we have professionals that, that basically focus on these matters. And I just find that most of the, the, the providers that we're dealing with don't have the cultural and linguistic, you know what I'm saying, skills in order to deal with our communities. And that's what we need to have. And nobody should go to that. So I want to give a special thanks to um, Lieutenant Susan Bicewich for the um, citation. I really, truly believe that it was heartfelt and that I really, my, my family really appreciate it. I want to also, the elders of um, New Haven and also um, Mayor Justin Elliker, I want to say thank you again. But I really want to give a profound thanks to Nicole, to Jason, who sat on the phone with us for an hour and a half through a Zoom call, looked at every document, every picture, every, everything that we had to show that this evidence was produced as we were bringing this child into the ER, and we were basically 
denied access, discriminated, made a mockery of, and then the accounts um, quoted Mount Town Centrum as though we were exaggerating these services. And you know, Senator Kelly, I really appreciate the fact that you gave me this platform to tell this story again. I told it before, but nothing's been done. My grandson will have been dead for two years, August 2022, and nothing's been done. And our situation has gotten worse. And I'm just begging you guys, please, put the money in the, into the infrastructure to get the services for these kids, the ones that you do see and the ones you may not see. Hire competent, high-level psychiatric doctors who are culturally competent and also diverse. We never see black doctors. We never interact with black doctors in the hospitals. That's very important. It's very important that you have Hispanic doctors or doctors that are linguistically um, competent. It's very important. That's how people open up by seeing people that look like them. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And if you have any questions, you can contact the Golden Gate contact with me. My grandson died on the watch of Connecticut. And I want to make a profound difference. And I want to make sure that his name is not in vain. Thank you. Antonia, we certainly appreciate your strength and advocacy mm -hmm. uh, to pay this forward. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a very heartfelt thank you. <laughs> and, and emotional story. I truly mean it. And uh, thank you no problem. Uh, I truly for mean that. It. Uh, now, moving on, I'd like at this time to introduce uh, our other ranking member of the Public Health uh, Committee, uh, Senator. Heather Summers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. As you've heard previous speakers state, uh, we had a mental health crisis here in the state of Connecticut before COVID reared its ugly head. We have a disjointed, disconnected system of care. There's no continuum of care. Uh, people search for days to try to find help. We don't have enough providers. There's no coordination between our local schools and the healthcare community in an acute setting. So we really need to start to look at this holistically. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure your grandson did not die in Thank vain. You. We are I going really to fix it. That. So <laughs> I think right now there is an unprecedented number of families, of children seeking behavioral health services here in the state of Connecticut and very limited availability of that kind of help. There is no more important issue in this state legislature, and it's time that the legislature step up mm -hmm. and fund properly and provide the resources that are needed for families and children that are dealing with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Mental health stigma needs to end. Mm -hmm. the, the logo should be, it's time for your checkup from the neck up. Okay. And it should be something that is part of your annual physical. If you go to other countries, which I travel to, mental health is part of the holistic approach to how you are physically and mentally, they go together, and the stigma is not nearly what it is here in the United States. So I just wanted to give you some interesting information that I got from Children's Medical, uh, Ch Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Did you know that suicide is the number two cause of death in youth till 18? The number two. If we had children that were sick with cancer, we wouldn't turn their back on them. So if we have children and families that are sick with mental health issues, we need to step up and give them the care that they need. Last year, Connecticut Children's Medical Center saw over 3,100 children that came in in crisis mode into the ER for behavioral health issues. The average wait time is 72 hours languishing in the ER before they can hope to try to find you some placement. And that's here in Hartford. You come to my district, we are a desert for mental health issues. Not issues, solutions. I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten from families that are struggling that I have to call in my favors of my doctor friends to try to find them placement. And if we do, it's usually in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, or someplace hours away from their family. And for those that don't call their state legislator, what happens to them? They fall through the cracks. It's a huge issue. So this caucus has put together some solutions that we think are very intentional and we think can help to move the needle. They're not the complete solutions. We need all hands on deck for that, but they certainly move the needle in the right direction. So I'd like to go through some of them with you. The first idea we have to offer is to expand the coverage for mental health care professionals. 
and this is a little bit complicated, but our Husky program has a long list of people waiting for services. Husky does not cover someone who is a master's degree social worker who is focused on behavioral health. They have to be a licensed clinical social worker, which requires 3,000 hours. Other health insurances will cover a master's degree social worker because they're being supervised. So if we could allow Husky to pay for master's degree social workers that are being supervised to take clients and be reimbursed, we could instantly help to lower that wait list for care. Husky patients tend to be, and historically if you look at the record, are those that help in many cases are most vulnerable and they need help. Yet we have this long line with clinicians waiting to see patients, but because of the reimbursement, they are not connected. So that's our first idea. This is an important start to increasing the access to mental he health care. We'd like to make telehealth permanent, especially for mental health. People ask me, why would you do that? Don't you want to see the doctor in person? Many of the families that are, that are suffering or vulnerable, the mothers, the fathers, the caregivers, they have to work full time. They do not have the ability to take off for an hour at a one o'clock on a Thursday afternoon to take their child in person to see a clinician. There is nothing more valuable in mental health than having the ability for telehealth where you can telehealth your child from the comfort of your own surrounding, even in the evening, sometimes on the weekend, to make it easier and accessible for those that are seeking care. I hear that time and time again. We need to support the mental health workforce by establishing a tuition reimbursement program. This is something that myself and I know Senator Wong have been pushing in, in public health for years, a recruitment program because we just do not have enough providers in the state of Connecticut. You know, we have a shortage nationwide, but literally in some areas of Connecticut, it is a desert for mental health providers. Our nonprofits do a great job, but they're not funded properly. They're overwhelmed and they can only handle so much. So we need to recruit new people to come into the field. There's other ideas that we have also in besides tuition reimbursement that I'm hoping that public health will entertain in this session. The mental health availability for children is critical. Um, you know, we have unmeasurable pressure. Uh, the schools can't handle it. They're not equipped to handle mental health issues. We have one school psychologist, maybe a social worker, with lines and lines of children waiting to come see them, especially after COVID. There's this increase in, in anxiety where the little children, they don't even know how to describe what anxiety is. They talk about their feelings and they don't know what anxiety means. That coupled with the fact these psychologists and these social workers have all these IEPs that they have to get through by law uh, for those that are on a regimen, they are overwhelmed. We need to be able to connect the schools with the acute setting, with the pediatrician, so that we can have a continuum of mental health care. And what's happened, quite frankly, and I have people in my district that have allowed me to talk about this, when a student or a child who's in crisis does not get the care they need, they end up in the ER. The ER bed is $1,800 a day on average. Sometimes they'll languish there for weeks, two weeks or three weeks before you can find a placement. If you get them to a placement, many of the placements, not in Connecticut, but in other states, are well below par. And they're put in a room with eight other kids that have also tried suicide. Some are older, some are younger, with somebody sitting in the middle watching them. And you know what they do? They swap stories. They talk about, how did you try to do it? Oh, this is how I try to do it. And we get more ideas on how to go out with, you know, commit that awful uh, thing that no parent ever wants to deal with. Then when they get out, they can get a, an appointment, but it might take four weeks to get an appointment at a local center if you have somebody, and it's not consistent. That person falls through the cracks again. They end up in the ER again in crisis. And we talk about cost. If we could intervene earlier, we could avoid this. This particular little girl is now having to go to a special school that the school district will have to pay for. It's just the cycle that is not working and it needs to be addressed and it needs to be fixed. Um, we wanna look and make sure that the Department of Public Health and the Department of uh, Mental Health and Addiction Service develop a plan together to increase the capacity with stakeholders, with clinicians, on facilities that we could create to house children, especially those in an acute situation. Social media has a large impact on how children's mental health um, can be affected. We'd like to engage in a study on the social media impact uh, between school districts and enter into an agreement with UConn to study that so we can look at the impact that social media may have on our children's 
mental health. That is something that comes up time and time again. We also need to look at the coverage for therapy. Uh, many times, um, insurance companies will cover you for mental health, but there's a very limited number of times that you can see a clinician. It's kind of like if you have physical therapy, you know, for your hip, you can go 10 times and then you're done. We think that the clinicians should decide what is appropriate for people that are going through mental health therapy, just like you would if you had cancer or some other type of disease. You know, you don't, if you're in, in for chemotherapy, they don't say, I'm sorry, that's five visits and you're done now. Um, so it should be considered in the same way. We also would like to promote um, some significant changes for maternal health. We want to make sure that those that are um, out there in the field get visits. They get checked on by pediatricians when you go in for your visit with your newborn child, that the pediatrician is also asking how the mother is doing. Um, there is a big t disconnect in maternal health, especially among minorities in the state of Connecticut. We want to require screening for pediatricians. We want to talk about educating providers on postpartum depression and what that looks like. We want to educate patients to easy access and to be able to talk about postpartum depression in a way that is not stigmatized. And for many people, they don't realize that postpartum depression does not show up on day two when you come home with a baby. It's weeks later when everyone's gone home and you've been up all night and your baby's crying and not eating. That's when depression can set in. And if you're not aware of it or your family members are not aware of it, it can go down a path that has a very, very difficult recovery. We want to partner with groups like PSI to get the information to families. And we want to cover these, um, these visits. And we also would like to make Maternal Health Month May 5th in May and to make May 5th World Maternal Mental Health Day. Um, we think that's very important. A healthy mom makes healthy kids. And when you have a mom who is not healthy, whether it's physically or mentally, it takes an impact on, on children. So those are some of the proposals that we're looking at. Um, additional information and details will be coming forward on some of these. But there's a lot of work to do, and we are committed as a caucus to make sure that mental health is a priority. Every one of us, when we've talked, has heard it from our district. And I believe that COVID and the pandemic and the isolation of the last two years has just really highlighted the voids within our system. And it has come to be where more and more people, unfortunately, are experiencing mental health and behavioral issues either themselves or with their children. And they, too, are starting to see the disconnect of our system that needs to be revamped. So I thank you for listening, and I'm going to turn it back over to Senator Kelly. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Senator Summers, uh, for your insight uh, on these various mental health initiatives. I'd also like to recognize other members of our caucus that are with us this morning. Uh, first and foremost, my deputy, uh, Senator Paul Formica, uh, also Senator John Kissel, Senator Eric Berthel and Senator, I believe we got to Senator Wong before. Okay, so once again, as you've heard me say before, uh, good, good ideas uh, will find friends. And we believe that this is a better way uh, to mental health in Connecticut, and we hope you do too. Questions?